the amount of built area that will be added to the planet every month is the equivalent of all New York five boroughs. So every level of every tower and every apartment building is being added to the planet somewhere every month. Concrete, steel, and aluminum, just those three materials contribute around 23% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, which is higher than all transportation combined. So if we have the ability to replace even a small percentage of the concrete and steel used to build the structure of buildings with renewable materials without depleting the forest, I feel like we all would say yes to that. Uh, mass timber is not a trend. Mass timber is not a niche. It's a real, uh, in my opinion, universal solution to lowering the fossil fuel emissions of all built environments. This is the Mass Timber Group Show. I'm Nick. And I'm Brady, and we talk to sustainable building experts. Today, we caught up with Lindsay Wickstrom, the founding partner of the design practice Mataforma, a professor with Syracuse, Cornell, Columbia, and Yale. And to top it off, she's the author of an incredible book titled Designing the Forest and Other Mass Timber Futures. This episode unpacks the history of forests and pulls apart the fears people have with harvesting timber. A statistic that blew me away was globally we are building the same area as all five bureaus of New York City combined every single month. That's over 1 million buildings monthly. Sustainable construction has never been more critical. But before we jump in, we're helping AEC professionals learn to build with Mass Timber so that they can change the world with their projects at the next Mass Timber Group Summit taking place in Denver. Save your seat by clicking the link in the show notes below. So with that, let's get into it. Hi, I'm Lindsay Wickstrom. I am the founder of Mataforma, an architecture firm based in New York City. Um, I'm also a professor at Columbia University and Yale, teaching architecture studio to graduate students. I've also taught the professional practice course at Columbia University um, in their architecture um, department. And so I, I'm kind of combining practice and academia in order to create a life for myself. And one of the most recent projects and one of the reasons we're talking today is my new book, Designing the Forest and Other Mass Timber Futures. And it's a book that um, has gathered a lot of the research that I worked on in the studios at Columbia University um, with students exploring in their projects and in their research and it has culminated as a book. And it's also a book about the future of my architecture practice, where I want the projects to go, what kinds of questions I want the projects to answer. Um, and so I'm excited to have that as a kind of roadmap as I go along. To tell you where I came from, um, it's a little bit of a long story, but I'll try to hit the highlights here. Um, I went to Columbia University as a grad student in the architecture program. Um, that's how I became close with a lot of the professors there. I learned from really extraordinary people like Mabel Wilson, Hilary Sample, David Benjamin. Uh, those three have really been mentors to me throughout my academic career. Um, I'd say that Hilary really inspired me to create books. Mabel really inspired me to think about who builds architecture and who's involved in the practice and who is benefiting from our choices as designers. And David's um, you know, influence has really been about the importance of embodied energy and materials, which we can talk a little bit more about. Um, before I went to Columbia University, I attended Arizona State University where I developed this really fundamental belief that um, design can integrate really well with the environment and be considerate of our climate. And I think that's an extraordinary place to learn about architecture in the middle of the desert where resources are quite scarce. Um, and before that, I went to high school in Tucson, Arizona, another place where resources are scarce and 
had the opportunity to work for an architecture firm there as a young person, um, which was an extraordinary opportunity. And so how did you make the leap uh, from coming up in the architecture world and then being a professor uh, at all these different wonderful schools to then deciding that you want to pick up and write a book that helps educate like the entire mass timber world about what it is and what it can do for us? That is such a great question. I, it was, uh, there were a lot of steps. So one of the first steps um, that I took towards developing my own opinions about mass timber and renewable resources in general was the invitation um, to teach a particular studio at Columbia, which is the fourth semester. It's called an advanced studio. It's where students have the option to choose you as a professor and develop your research with you. And the prompt for that uh, level of studio, so all of the professors that are teaching that year have to answer this prompt. The prompt was, what should students think about nature? What should be their opinion about nature? How should students learn about nature? It's one of the first studios that students had to work in sites that were topographically challenging. The first three semesters were really flat urban sites. And so I thought that was a great opportunity to think about where materials come from, you know, places of production, as opposed to pure cities where they're mostly places of consumption. And so how do we design those spaces of production and consumption to be more circular, more integrated, more aware of each other? And so the, the question that I posed to the studio was, can we build a mass timber living laboratory using New York wood? It was very simple. I thought, I thought it was very simple when I asked the question. And what happened was um, an enormous amount of research into why that isn't the case today, why that, what are all of the challenges um, behind that assumption? Um, what are all the hurdles logistically and spiritually and um, aesthetically um, relating to that idea? And those questions started to expand really rapidly and that's when I started to gather and collate those questions that students were um, generating and really follow through on them, uh, which takes longer than a semester to follow through on. So the timing of the book, the research and the literature review for the book was during the pandemic. And so I was teaching on Zoom and I was reading every book about mass timber that I could get my hands on. And then I read all of the books on history of forest management that I could get my hands on. And so that literature review lasted for one year and it really sharpened my opinion about what the industry is facing and the potential opportunities. And really both of those categories, hurdles and opportunities increased tenfold of what I originally assumed uh, mass timber was. And so um, during that time, I partnered with the publisher Routledge, who agreed to do a double peer, double blind peer review process, which also helped me refine the book topic to be geared and focused towards a general public, a general audience, as opposed to a specialized architect, someone who already knows what mass timber is and already knows what architecture is. And I really enjoyed that process because I firmly believe that this is such a collective endeavor, you know, creating plant-based cities of the future that everyone needs to find their place within this future. And um, I really value working with industry, working with manufacturers, working with foresters, working with high school students, working with, um, you know, people who are retired, people who are um, ecologists or scientists, and all of those in between. And so for the book to really have this general audience um, was extraordinary. And then I worked with a copy editor and, and it found, eventually, you know, the book found um, a really good place and a really understandable text. It's 40,000 words. 
Um, it incorporates 100 drawings that I drew and a handful of maps that are really amazing um, uh, visualizations of forest ownership and deforestation zones, um, maps that I had never seen uh, published before. And so I thought that could be a real contribution um, to the industry, which maybe I'll, I'll kind of wrap up here. That idea that I could also contribute to such an industry that's full of brilliant people was one of the goals. And there was so much learning in order to really produce new knowledge. Um, and that whole process was really an amazing experience. So the, the final product is quite strange to have it all be done, um, but it was a really amazing uh, process and memory. And so now I have this opportunity to share it with folks. And so I'm now I'm in that phase. Hey, we're going to get back to the podcast in just a second. But first, I have a question for you. Are you somebody looking to build a mass timber project? If the answer is yes, then you need to put together an experienced team. Our partners at Cornerstone Timber Frames are leaders in heavy timber construction and have 30 plus years of experience, which means you can trust them to get the job done right. They collaborate with Nordic Structures to bring you the highest quality FSC certified mass timber available. They also have some of the most advanced fabrication technology in the industry, so your project goes up smoothly without costly on-site modification or delays. That means they have the experience, network, and technology to make your next mass timber project a success. Learn more about Cornerstone Timber Frames by clicking the link in the show notes below. Congrats. It's a beautiful book, and we recommend everyone go to Amazon and check that out. It's Designing the Forest and Other Mass Timber Futures. It was released recently in the year 2023. I got a kind of this really spontaneous, I just kind of tripped over you. I mean, I, I went the, to the International Mass Timber Conference, and then there was an event trailing it. And and I, I went with my wife and we're like, well, let's go check this out. And, and you were presenting your book. And I just really appreciated all the diagrams and the pictures and the design of it because it's just not this, you know, type eight font, you know, just really it, it's it's more of a um, you can just kind of pick it up. And anywhere that you go in the book, you you know, you can just open it up and learn something. So it's a, a really cool book. And it, it sounds like that there's um, it's broken down into uh, the urgency, the past, the present and the future. Can you unpack that a little bit for the people? Definitely. Thank you for coming to the event. That was an amazing time. Um, I, I wrote the book in these four chapters, like you mentioned. The introduction is a really short chapter. It's meant to hook you. Um, and what it's really about is to share briefly why this is such an important topic for everyone to care about. Uh, mass timber is not a trend. Mass timber is not a niche. It's a real, uh, in my opinion, universal solution to lowering the fossil fuel emissions of all built environments, especially urban ones around the world. And so in the introduction, I share uh, many different aspects of that story, but one of the most important um, aspects that I share, one of the most important pieces of data is that the UN, in 2019, the UN um, predicted, is projecting that for the foreseeable future, the amount of construction built area that will be added to the planet every month is the equivalent of all New York five boroughs so every level of every tower and every apartment building is being added to the planet somewhere every month. So this, um, this amazing, this incredible, huge amount of built area is being added no matter what we do. It needs to be added. And it's not distributed evenly. A lot of that construction is happening in Africa and in India and in China. And so um, one of the big questions I have is, what will all of those buildings be built with? Because if they're built with the same materials that we've been using for the last 100 years, we are facing a really, really dramatic increase in fossil fuel emissions. Concrete, steel, and aluminum, just those three materials contribute around 23% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, which is higher than all transportation combined. So if we have the ability to replace even a small percentage 
of the concrete and steel used to build the structure of buildings with renewable materials without depleting the forest, I feel like we all would say yes to that. But the reason I wrote the next three chapters is because of that second part that I said, there's a lot of fear, depletion, biodiversity. Um, there's a lot of fear around the forest labor um, involvement in forestry and timber um, companies globally. There's a lot of fear about uh, trusting future generations to pick up this uh, mantle of stewardship. You know, how can we really depend on future generations to continue this way of treating the forest? Because the forest is a very multi-generational project. You know, one tree might take a hundred years to mature. So you're not going to see the trees that you plant. You're, you won't see them harvested. So you really have to understand this in a multi-generational way, which, you know, our way of living today isn't exactly tuned in to multi-generational thinking at large. And so there are a lot of uh, cultural challenges, logistical challenges, spiritual challenges uh, to, to give you a sense of those three chapters very briefly. The past chapter is about how we managed forests in the past. And it specifically talks about the difference between non-colonizing group groups and, and the way that they designed forests to sustain a particular society that's co-located with the forest and colonizing groups that designed forests to be sustaining a society that was not co-located with the forest and that those ways of thinking really changed the species that were planted in the actual forest. So the makeup, the biodiversity of the forest was altered by the distance uh, between the consumer and the producer. And still today we see the inherit inherited uh, forests of that time. And today we call them industrial forests. The second chapter um, is called verticality. And that unrolls the whole supply chain of labor that's involved in mass timber from people who plant trees, they carry these huge sacks of saplings on their back and hike miles and miles a day and actually burn the equivalent amount of calories of someone running two marathons in a day, planting these trees on the hillside, all the way to folks working in an automated sawmill, to folks working in a cross laminated timber plant, to those folks driving the trucks, to people in construction sites, and then to those thinking about designing for deconstruction. So really this whole circular flow and all of the people involved in that movement of material. And the reason I'm obsessed with that is because I want to think about architecture as a moment in time along that huge flow, as opposed to a static object that uh, is never really thought of again. I am so much more inspired by the choreography of materials as opposed to the sculpting of them. And then the third chapter, well, the fourth chapter um, after the intro is called Underpinning. And this one really focuses on what we truly believe our relationship with nature could be and what kinds of ideas about nature's value are we subconsciously inheriting from the past, particularly from the romantic era, which framed the forest as a virgin that needed saving. And a lot of those, story tell, those stories that were told um, really altered our engagement with the forest as another living being. And I don't think that um, every culture has the same belief, you know, as, as a kind of Western worldview we have here in the U S. Um, so that's another whole book that could be written about all the variety of interpretation of value of the forest, but by and large in the U S there are environmentalists, 
which are really, and it's unfair to generalize, but generally trying to prevent folks from harvesting trees. And then there are conservationists, which have no problem harvesting and maybe should be a little bit more hesitant. And so what I'm really interested in is the middle ground between those two groups. How can we both um, keep the forest healthy in the way that we harvest? How can we have a reciprocal relationship with the forest that heals our built environment and the forest at the same time? And the amazing thing that I get to at the very end of the book are examples of this happening out in the world. And so I love to share those um, examples when I speak about the book in public, because finally someone has, you know, some, a lighthouse to look towards as a way for that kind of relationship to happen. So hopefully we get to that across the country in my lifetime. That would be the ultimate thing to see. I'm glad you talked about the fear of, of harvesting trees and like this stigma about, um, forest management in general, because you are right. You know, there, there was an era, there was a time where, you know, we went in and we devastated forest and like, you know, we took out legacy forests and, you know, these old growth trees. But I think a lot of people have a, some trouble getting over that. And through your, your um, research, of forest management. I mean, what have you seen out there? What what would you tell these conservationists or these these people that are just petrified of of harvesting these trees? And and then in, in, in knowing that, you know, I, you mentioned that it's like sometimes fifty to a hundred years until these trees become um, old enough and mature enough to harvest. And then on the flip side, though, there are these other complete regions like the southern yellow pine, you know, in the south of, uh, you know, that, you know, call it Texas, call it Florida, these types of regions where it only takes about 20 to 25 years for that tree to be, you know, grown into maturity, which is extraordinarily rapid. Like these these forests are treated like a crop of like corn and they can be um it, it, there's just a different reality. And so like, what would you say to those people so they could kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel on why this is a better way of construction and it's not devastating our forests? Yeah, that is one of the trickiest questions. So let's start with New York State first before we look at the whole country. That was one of my first research projects, like I mentioned, that research, just New York State forests, turned into my first white paper, which is a type of publication sponsored by a scientific body, in this case, the UN Environment. And this paper looked at the question, are there enough trees in New York State to support the amount of construction that New York City built? And so that was a volume question. And it was a volume question of um, not should we halt or reduce construction. I assumed that we would just continue the same amount that New York adds every year, which is around 50 million square feet. So very generous of me to allow them to continue that. And then looking at only the three most prolific species in New York State, which are American beech, Eastern hemlock, and red maple. And I looked at how much volume or how much biomass is above ground. So how much can we harvest? Well, not, not how much can we harvest yet, but how much does exist, right? So I have a sense of how many acres of those three species exist. And then I looked at, and I worked with a forester to refine this data because the data is provided by the USDA, but the way that trees grow on one hillside in the sun versus the hillside in the shade is different. So there's all this kind of very, very local knowledge that would really give you a high fidelity data. Uh, but if we're looking at statewide, it's quite low fidelity. So I'll admit that. But generally, right, we looked at how many trees exist and then we looked at their rate of growth and their rate of growth incorporates the geometry of the tree and how long it takes for it to get to a mature state. 
and, and how many of them could exist in an acre. So trees don't really like to touch canopies. So if the tree is short and wide, there's gonna be less volume of wood per acre than if it's skinny and tall. So Douglas fir, for example, the most prolific tree on the planet because it's super straight, super skinny and super tall. Red maple, not so much, right? It's wide, kind of short, a little bit crooked. It's less productive. So we looked at um, how much volume comes from these forests per year, according to their um, rate of maturity. And then I learned from working with foresters, um, specifically at Black Rock Forest, which is a, for a research forest in New York, we looked at maturity and how that's interpreted. So there's no set number for how many years a particular species grows to maturity. This is also an interpretive value. We could say uh, reproductive maturity, which is the time it takes to drop seeds naturally. But sometimes that takes so long in particular species that it would grow too big to fit on a sawmill blade. So that means that economic maturity would govern but you would lose the natural ability to be regenerative in the forest. And that's where this designing the forest really happens is how can you design the sawmill to, you know, account for this. So I just assumed reproductive maturity. So we set that number and then we generated how much built area would come from that volume every year without depleting the forest. So cyclical. So it's being replanted in kind and it's generating timber and, and how much could you really generate if you did it like that? And we could generate more than 60 million square feet of built area of mass timber every year with just those three species in perpetuity without ever depleting the forest. So the next question is, what would it take to really orchestrate something like that? because New York state is full of private property. And so it would require a land management plan that shared among hundreds of property owners for the good of the construction of New York City. I mean, the social contract alone would be a feat of engineering. And so that's just New York state. And then when you mentioned, you know, Southern Yellow Pine, the regions down in the South, those are crossing state borders. Those are crossing uh, through indigenous land, federal land, private property, um, timber investment management organiza organization land. And each one of those groups manages the forest differently for a different interpretation of value. And in the South, it has been historically managed as a monocrop that's super successful it was loblolly pine, and now it has incorporates a few other pines. Um, it was the the place where a lot of the turpentine was generated for waterproofing boats, uh, for shipping for the last 500 years, especially during the colonies. So the area has been super productive for a lot longer than anything in the Northeast. And... Um, I think what they're facing now is a different challenge of, of resilience in the face of climate change. So one of the thoughts that I share with a friend who I met at the uh, Mass Timber, the International Mass Timber Conference, who is managing a huge swath of Southern Yellow Pine is this issue of biodiversity and multi-generational trees for the long run, the importance of having multi-age trees and biodiversity to last through these changes that are coming as the planet heats up. So um, I'll share two thoughts on that. First, different species help each other through the seasons. So deciduous trees are known to um, shade conifers in the summer, but that also means that they'll pass them nutrients under the ground to keep them alive and then vice versa in the winter when deciduous trees have no leaves left coniferous trees can pass them nutrients under the ground so there's this relationship between 
species um, that is really important to maintain and understand. And we're just at the beginning of understanding all of those relationships. The second thing is multi-generational trees. One of the most fascinating frontiers of forest ecology happening right now and led by the forest ecologist Suzanne Simard is the understanding that the mother tree or the older trees, old growth trees, as some folks call them, actually store knowledge about defeating pests, um, staying alive during wildfire, wildfires, and um, staying alive during drought. And so if we plant huge areas of young trees, there will literally, there will be no older trees to teach them how to survive those um, experiences, those extreme uh, weather conditions. And so the South is facing this huge challenge right now. And um, I, I think same with the Pacific Northwest, we've seen an increase, an increase of mega fires um, in the past 10 years that are really coming from this exact topic. So I think, you know, to answer your question about, I think there's this real um, need that, I mean, forest ecologists know all about is how to create spaces of resilience. And a lot of that has to do with harvesting in geometries that don't include clearing, harvesting in ways that don't impact the soil, but then planting biodiversity, which also means tuning our construction industry to maybe, um, the rate that trees grow. Can you imagine, right? Cities actually have limits on construction based on the forest that they are in relationship with. That would be truly phenomenal. So we have this entire uh, ecosystem, for lack of a better word, from you know forest to forest management, to the people that live next to it, to the sawmills, like that entire journey of what it takes to plant a seed to get to something that turns into uh, timber that's used for buildings. What's on the other side of that equation? So we, we understand how to get to the, the building material uh, in a sustainable, ecological and environmentally friendly way. How do we then encourage people to use these materials, make it feasible, make it uh, common knowledge and accessible? Wow, such a good question. Um, I think one of, the, one of the main things that I am working on, and the reason I wrote the book, one of the many reasons I wrote the book was to increase people who are excited about this, you know, um, bring more people into the story, um, create more demand, because the, mar the, the forest is growing more trees per year than we can even harvest from it. There's no, um, there, it, it is ready to give us tons and tons of volume of materials of, of wood um, and remain very healthy. But one of the biggest problems is there's such um, a reduced demand right now. And what I see mass timber as such an important player in increasing the demand um, for wood is using them in urban environments. And so part of that, you know, a big part of that has to do with aesthetics and then knowledge like you're describing. Um, people usually have the right sense to be skeptical about fire, water, termites, um, hanging pictures on the wall, um, you know, earthquakes that, you know, how is this material structurally performing um, in a way that's um, similar or better than concrete? And that's a huge knowledge hurdle. That, that uh, process of teaching everyone uh, what the industry is, what they know and what they're learning on a daily basis is um, an advocacy project that I'm sure I'll be part of my entire life. And so, for example, right now, you know, concrete is, I mean, it's thousands of years old, but it's actually in our modern world, 120 years old. And our codes, our building codes are, are based on the knowledge that has been accumulated over those 120 years. Mass timber, some people say it's 30 years old, in Austria, in New York, it's one year old. It's one year, one year old. So 
we have a long way to go to really establish an understanding of what it can do for us and how do we work with it, because it's really not as simple as applying concrete ideas to mass timber structures. You can't just switch out a concrete column for a mass timber column. There has to be an entirely new way of thinking about how that structure is working, how it changes over time, um, how is it maintained, where does it come from, how is it tested, and all of those tests have been happening. And when you go to these conferences like the International Mass Timber Conference, you get exposed to all of that new research and amazing projects, demonstration projects. Um, so every year, the industry is advancing significantly through both private and public um, investment. However, we're still learning. And so um, bringing, every, bringing the public along in that journey is really important and being really open, I think, and being transparent about what we don't know is also important. And your journey started uh, quite a long time ago with uh, a gentleman with, by the name of David Benjamin at, at a project called The Living, which is a super cool mass timber project. If you could speak to a little bit about that and then maybe kind of um, direct into your new mass timber project under Mataforma. And for people, that's M-A-T-T-A Forma. Her, uh, you know, one of the founder of the architectural firm there, but you have this super cool project in Arizona uh, that has uh, mass timber that's getting um, designed into it. So if you could talk about that. Yeah, thank you. So I was recruited to this group called The Living, which is led by David Benjamin, one of my professors when I was a graduate student at Columbia University. Um, he started this project with Airbus. And when it became a building, that's when I was brought onto the team to be the project architect for the new engine factory um, in Hamburg. And so we, as a team, we worked with Airbus and their stakeholders. In this case, there were three production lines that were going to be under the same roof. We used an amazing custom generative design tool to incorporate those three production lines, uh, their efficiency in regards to measuring the sustainability and operational energy, embodied energy, and experience of the building. Um, that story is really interesting, probably for another podcast, but that experience was really influential to me because I had the opportunity to understand and think about what the trade-offs of using mass timber would be in a building and not necessarily assume that it was a silver bullet for any project that was pursuing sustainability goals. We really had to measure its impact um, in concert with many other impacts like energy efficient building envelope or um, energy efficient mechanical systems, uh, for example. And so that's why you see when you look at the renderings, you'll see a hybrid structure that uses aluminum facade cassettes with a Baubuka, which is an LVL, which is also a laminated veneer lumber system that's made and grown in Germany. So the whole project was really my um, getting into me getting into mass timber in the weeds and understanding how it becomes a real project. Um, and I had the opportunity to meet amazing folks in Germany, um, specifically Herman Bloomer, who's an amazing influencer in the mass timber space. Um, and so when I left that position, I took a lot of those ideas and relationships and uh, workflows into uh, my new um, architecture practice called Mataforma. So we launched uh, Mataforma in 2021. And um, some of the first projects were about mass timber. They're thinking about uh, the utilization of blanks. Um, one, one project that we did early on was called Natural Number Houses. It was featured on this uh, Instagram account that was amazing. And we did um, seven houses, each one using another blank fully without any offcuts. So just designing with limits in mind and thinking about the geometry and aesthetics that come with those limits. Um, 
you know, not long after we did some of those projects, uh, we were approached by a group, a really incredible group uh, based in Arizona in the town of Cottonwood, who are developing a biodynamic farm to table experience. And, you know, they, because they're so passionate about healthy food, um, we had this great opportunity to share the oppor- the the way that we would think about materials is similar to the way that they would think about food. So they are designing the soil to be um, nutrient dense. They're designing the waste processes of the agriculture to return to the earth. And we think about materials in the same way, really. We think about where the wood is harvested, what the nature of that soil is. And then we think about designing for deconstruction and how those biogenic structures can eventually return to the earth. And so it was a real connection for both of us to find each other. And so now that project is going forward into architectural design this year and will feature about 40 overnight spaces um, a restaurant and a few, um, you know, farm experiences for folks that really want to be in touch with the high desert of Arizona and its abundance. Yeah, you said it. I think there's a lot of overlap in the built environment and the food system, and we could do a whole other podcast on the food system, but we won't go in there. But I'm a big fan of melding those two universes together. Uh, I think there's a lot of symbolism and crossover between the two. So I- I'm excited to see where that project goes. Um, One question that we ask a lot of people who are incredibly knowledge like yourself, and you talked about going into, you know, a year, a year's worth of literature review, getting up to speed on everything that you're talking about in your book. Obviously, you're a professor teaching in all these wonderful schools. Where do you go to learn about mass timber, about your profession? Like, how do you stay on top of things? Where do you where do you go for that information? Yeah, it's a great question. You guys are full of really (laughs) awesome questions. So. I am inspired by so many folks. I mean, I I learn a lot through conversation, to be really honest. I mean, talking to people, asking them questions, what their daily life is like, uh, and and having the opportunity to meet foresters and ecologists and timber manufacturers, and especially people who own forests and own manufacturing plants. Those folks really are just rich sources of information. Um, So I love talking to people like... um, Russ Vaughan, who I'm sure that you've spoken with. And um, for example, because he has such um, an amazing knowledge about the industry, but I also have read, you know, books by colleagues of mine in the academic space, like Jennifer Bonner, Keel Mo, you know, they gathered so much great um, knowledge and research and thinking. And so it was just um, impossible to avoid digging into all of their amazing content Um, I also looked at a lot of the work by historian Paul Ward for the book, and I just found his writing, I mean, to be so thorough and so interesting, although maybe if you're a a history buff, you would be really into it, but it's quite, um, you know, like I said, thorough, so it's not a super entertaining um, work, but I just thought it was amazing to think of mass timber in the context of what he's describing. So he has two books that I would recommend. One is called The History of Wood, and one is called The History of the Environment. And The History of the Environment um, goes into the concept of the environment that we've created this new concept that we are thinking about these days called the environment and that that wasn't always the case. Um, So he talks a lot about how that concept came to be um, utilized in in our world. Um, And then the history of wood was really about uh, mostly uh, British and German um, forestry practices throughout the last 1000 years, specifically to create a stable state, which is a really amazing thing to think about, really powerful but then also a really interesting uh, warning, you know, I think for the future, how do we um, disperse ownership of forests and maintain stability? This is one of my biggest questions uh, because his history reveals that 
um, the thinking, you know, for the last hundreds of years is that the bigger the owner, the more stable, you know, the more singular the owner, the most more stable. So a monarchy that owns the forest is the most stable. So I think his, his history is incredible. And then I guess the, the other author that I am really inspired by, I read a lot of science fiction. I love thinking about these really wild futures and I love the co the quote by William Gibson that the future is already happening. It's just not where you are. Um, that's always just a really inspiring thing to think about. And it gives me a lot of hope. So Gibson is a great author. I love Ursula Le Guin's work. I read a lot of Margaret Atwood. Um, you know, I, I read a lot of Octavia Butler. And I think about how they blend these topics of ecology, politics, gender, and labor into a story. And it's really, uh, to me, really exciting because um, this idea of the kind of multi-hyphenate in this world, which, which means people who do many things for the good of, you know, society or, you know, people who are, you know, designer, ecologist, uh, scientist, author, this kind of multi-hyphenate position is what we've all kind of always been. And that that's been our kind of constant state of contribution. Um, so these science fiction authors really build those worlds uh, that to me are, are really thrilling. And then I guess one last idea to, to shout out to people is this new HBO documentary, documentary that just came out this year called Trees and Other Entanglements. And I had the opportunity, I was visiting the site in Arizona, came back from a long day at the ranch, dusty, like tired, turned on the TV. And it was this beautiful documentary called Trees and Other Entanglements. And it's just so amazing. And it, it dives into all the things we talked about here, people's just real strong connection to trees and our projection of our own lives into the forest and how different that is than working with minerals like concrete and steel. And those are dead and durable. It's like, if we're going to work with trees, there is this living thing that we have to deal with, that we have to make a relationship with. And this documentary outlines those relationships in such a beautiful way. So highly recommended. And of course, Suzanne Simard's book, Finding Mother Tree. Um, and then Peter, Peter, um, Wolin Bolin. I feel so bad. I always get his last name wrong. Wolin. He wrote Hidden Life of Trees. Maybe you know this author. Peter Wolin Ben. There we go. That list is great. I must say that quote that you said, the future is already happening. It's just not where you are. That that really kind of hit a chord. And then especially you talked about how like mass timber, you know, it's debated if it's been around 30 years, but it's only been around one year in New York and then in other places, other reg regions of North America, you know, early nineties, like it's debatable if it's 12 or 13 years old and, you know, the Portland's and the Seattle's and, you know, the, the, um, the, in the ca Canadian provinces or wherever, but it, it's just, uh, can you imagine like the, the it, I'm just so excited about this industry and it sounds like that you are too, where there's so much to learn. There's so much to do. And I mean, imagine, you know, the mid 1800s, early, or, you know, mid early 1900s with the industrial age and skyscrapers and just how long it really took to take hold. And we're, we're truly in a revolution. And so it was just a, that's that's really exciting. I two people need to get out and, and travel to different cities and go to the International Mass Timber Conference where, you know, we'll, we'll see you there in March and and just experience these types of places that that quote, the future is already happening, but it's just not where you are. That that was pretty cool. Um, thank you for uh, all of the, that list of, um, you know, uh, uh, books and, and places to learn. Uh, before we ask our last question, where can people find you to talk more, you know, possibly do some business, you know, in the sense of like design and architecture and, and maybe talk to you about uh, more about your book. Thank you. I would love to hear from anyone who wants to work on a project together, big or small, tall or short, you know, anything in between. Um, you can find me at matterforma.com and my email is 
lwickstrom at mataforma.com. I would love to hear from you. Perfect. And so our, our best, uh, our final question is fun. So if you had a magic wand and you can change anything <laughs> in the world, anything about the industry, what would it be and why? Okay. Let's see. Magic wand. I think that I would, I would love to change our reaction towards a particular type of harvested forest. So there's this way of harvesting that um, folks work in long straight lines into the forest um, as opposed to clearing. And if we were to come upon that type of harvesting, which you can see, right? It still generates stumps in the forest. Everyone would think that's very beautiful because if everyone really appreciated the effort that it takes to harvest in that manner, in this controlled way, replant trees and really take care of the forest, we could really appreciate those in-between type, those in-between aesthetics in the forest, like, like a harvested zone and say, you know, wow, like new life, new change, as opposed to, you know, only the most dense forest being the most beautiful version of itself. So if we all thought that version of harvesting was very beautiful, that would be my magic wand wish. Perfect. Well, we will see you in a few months in Portland at the International Mass Timber Conference and implore anybody else, you got to get out there. It's it's life-changing. It's, uh, it's the global stage for mass timber. So we're excited for that. Um, thank you so much. We And also go get Designing the Forest and other Mass Timber Futures on Amazon. Lindsay, you're great. And we can't wait to see uh, what, what you bring to the future. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. Cheers. Have a good day. If you are looking to build a Mass Timber project, come meet the Cornerstone Timber Frames team July 31st through August 2nd at the Mass Timber Group Summit in Denver, Colorado.